I'm going to preach for a little while. I don't think a message has to be eternal in order to have eternal consequences and success. Can somebody say amen? So I want you to find Luke chapter 22. And in Luke chapter 22, we're going to start looking at verse number 14. And of course, this is the Passion Week. Today is the beginning of the week of Passion. We call it Holy Week or Passion Week. It's the last week of Jesus' life on earth prior to his crucifixion and resurrection. And uh, I want to talk about the word passion today. I really want that to be a, a big word. So can you say it with me? Come on, say it. Passion. That was pitiful. <laughs> I said, say the word passion. passion. On the count of one more time, on the count of three. Passion. All right, I want to talk about what Jesus was passionate about, okay? Because what Jesus was passionate about reveal what you can be passionate about. Because not only is Jesus' passion important, but your passion is important. How many are sick and tired of seeing people in our world today with no passion? I mean, seriously. They're not passionate about their jobs. I'm not meddling right now. I'm just making an observation. They're not passionate about the place of business that you're shopping in. They're not passionate about the place they're serving you food. They're not, not passionate about serving. They're not passionate about what they do. They're just going through the motions. It, it, I, I, if there's anything that will destroy a person's joy and hope in life, it's wandering through life without any passion. And I'm not really being critical today. I'm trying not to, but I'm just making an observation. People have no passion whatsoever. They they just wander around. It, it seems like they stare at their phones constantly. Can I tell you that this little thing right here has destroyed the passion of most Americans' mind? We can't think for ourselves. I had a revelation in the first service. I said most people stare at a four by six di digital illuminated demon that has all kinds of power to occupy their mind. And they have no, no passion whatsoever. I mean... I said this in the first service, so I must go ahead and say it this morning. I challenge you to look next time you go to the stoplight and look to your right and to your left and see 85% of them. The first thing they do when they stop at the stoplight is pop the phone out. Yeah. And there they are. There, there they are. And I know it's illegal to text and drive. I really don't know technically. I'll have to ask to <laughs> Not the judge. <laughs> if it's wrong to like park and text, you know, if you're stopped at a stoplight and you're texting, is that legal? I really don't know, honestly. I, I don't know. But I do know that on most occasions, it's five seconds after the light turns green and they're 100 yards down the road finishing the conversation before they end up putting the phone away. I have been known to honk at the person next to me and go like this. Sometimes I have been that guy. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm not surprised. Pastor is that guy. I have been that guy on a couple occasions. But uh, people are just lulled to oblivion. They're, they're just, their minds are numbed down and, and dumbed down. And, and there's no passion. So I want to talk to you about the passion of Jesus. And this is a biblical story, a biblical message and, and we don't need to understand the passion that drove the life of Jesus. But I also want you to catch my drift this morning that the same passion that drove Jesus' life is passionate in the Word of God and it can drive your life. It can give you joy. It can give you strength. It can give you encouragement. It can give you, give you empowerment to everything that God has for you. So we're going to look at Luke chapter 22. And this is the story of Jesus being passionate about sharing his last supper with his disciples. But I want to remind you, we put a couple graphics on the screen. The first one is a simple one that shows this is Passion Week. So this little simple graphic tells what happened on Sunday, what happened on Monday, Jesus angered the religious crowds on Monday. He threw the vendors out of the temple. On Tuesday, he confronted the hypocrisy of the Jewish leaders. He called them blind leaders of the blind. He said, you look like whitewashed tombs. You're all clean on the outside, but on the inside, you're full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. Is it any wonder the religious people didn't like Jesus? I mean, they were the epitome of political correctness, and Jesus called them out on it. Every time they changed hypocrisy, 
hypocrisy uh, in, instead of reality. They switched to hypocrisy instead of uh, relationship. They turned it to religion instead of truth. They, they, they changed it to, to appearances. And Jesus called about it. Now, on Wednesday, Judas was bribed to betray Jesus. On Thursday, he had the Last Supper with his disciples. Peter denied him. We talked about that on Wednesday night. We went to St. Peter's Church at Galicantu in Israel, and we talked about Peter denying, and that church is called the Cock's Crow because the rooster throwed, crowed three times to remind Jesus that, I mean, to remind Peter that Jesus had prophesied, by the time the rooster crows, you will have denied me three times. And then on Friday, of course, Jesus was crucified, and on Saturday that nothing happened in anticipation of the glorious resurrection of Jesus on Sunday. So having said that, in fact, there's another graphic, if you could throw that up, I guess I'll refer to it real quickly. I don't know if you can read that from where you're at, but this is uh, a lot of information that shows what happened all week. Saturday, which would have been yesterday, the day before Palm Sunday, and then Palm Sunday, then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Easter Sunday, it, it shows the different days of the week, the Jewish calendar, the different events that Mary anoints Jesus, the triumphal entry, uh, cleansing of the temple, the selection of the Passover lambs, Passover lamb taken into the homes, a woman anoints Jesus, the last, all these events. This, this is a huge Bible study. If you just study this chart for two or three hours, you'd get a picture of the whole Passion Week and what was happening this week that we are remembering today between Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday. But I want to center in on that word passion. S say it again with me. Passion. The dictionary says it's a strong, barely controllable desire. Any powerful or compelling emotion for feeling such as love or hate. A strong or extravagant fondness or enthusiasm or desire for something. The Greek New Testament word is the word epithemia. And it simply means strong desire. To have an intense desire for something. Now, this word epithemia, passion or strong desire, is often translated traditionally in the Bible as the word lust. Now, I know we initially think that the word lust is a bad word because it's often used in a sexual connotation. But really the word strong desire, the word epithemia that's translated lust is not particularly a wrong word. There's nothing wrong with having strong desires. In fact, we need strong desires in our lives. We need strong desires that are fulfilled according to the will and the wisdom of God for our lives. The only reason we get in trouble is if we try to satisfy our strong desires outside of the prescribed will of God. So the word lust in itself is, is not a bad word, but if we we lust after something that's not according to God's will for our lives, then it becomes a problem. Let me give you an example. I'll do these really quickly. Matthew chapter 13 says, truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people have long, there's the word strong desire, they, they lusted to see what you see and they did not see it and to hear what you see and did not hear. In other words, the, the prophets of old, that they had passionate desires to see prophecies fulfilled just like the, you and I. Oh man, is it true that we see Bible prophecy fulfilled before our very eyes right now in warp speed? I mean, all you have to do is turn on the six o'clock news today and you see Bible prophecy fulfilled and it reminds us that Jesus is coming soon. There were people that had strong desire to see what we see. You and I have all kinds of revelation that they didn't have. Luke chapter 15 says, speaking of the prodigal, he was longing, he had strong desire to be fed with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Now, Paul told Timothy, now get this, this is a paradox for you. Paul told Timothy, this saying is trustworthy that if anyone aspires to the office of an overseer, he has strong desire or he lusts for a noble task. I'll bet you haven't thought about that. But a person that's called to the ministry, if they have a strong desire, they have a passion to serve God in the ministry, then the Bible says that that's a noble thing. So in our text, Luke twenty two fifteen, 15, it says this. Jesus said to his disciples, look at it, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Jesus, seeing his disciples... The night that he was going to be betrayed, they, they had their last supper. And, and while they were doing it, he used this word. 
often translated lust, strong desire. He said, I have strongly desired, I have passionately desired to have this last supper with you before I suffer. So we got to say something here. If the last supper was so important, and that Jesus said, I passionately desire to have the last supper with you before I suffer, then what is Passover? And why was it all that important to Jesus? And we're going to get to that in a second. But before I do, I just want to back up for a minute and, and talk about Jesus. I don't know what your vision of Jesus is. I don't know what model you have of Jesus. But I pray to God you have the biblical model of who Jesus is rather than the Hollywood model of who Jesus is. How many are sick and tired of the Hollywood model of Jesus? I mean, there's never been... They need to get a man's man next time they make a Jesus movie. They need to get an Arnold Schwarzenegger, or they need to get a Rocky Balboa, or they need to get a Pastor Coates. I mean, talking about some kind of a... He, they need to get somebody that's got some strength about them next time they're going to put an actor on the screen and say, that's Jesus. Because these weak, mealy mouth, wishy-washy, mamby, pamby, no guts of an amigo or the spine of a gold... That, that we need to get a man's man... That has some passion. Come on, ladies, help me out here. I'm trying to inspire that guy sitting next to you. The ladies in the house want a man's man. Come on, somebody. The men in the house want a lady's lady. I could preach here a little while if you'd let me. We need to get delivered of this confusion that's destroying our culture. I'm going to get back to it after Easter. Remember this series that I gave you an introduction to a few weeks ago about counterfeit culture? There's nothing new under the sun. All of this demonic stuff that's being released in the culture right now is not new. And we know exactly where it came from. It came from the pit of hell. And it's revealed in the Old Testament by the gods of the Canaanites that Israel was warned not to worship. But they allowed the gods of Asherah and Baal and these spirits to come in and influence them. And it's the exact same thing that's happening in America today. Do we love people? Yes, we do. We love everybody. We love all people. Red, yellow, black, and white, confused, whatever they might be. We love them all the same. But we also love people enough to tell them the truth. And that is that God created them in his image and with one image he created them male and female and he gave them the desire to have a personal relationship with him and live together for him with ever in heaven and we want people to know that God's plan and purpose for their life was set in stone the day that they were born when the chromosomes came to contact in their mother's womb God was not confused and the miracle of conception was not at random it was by divine design that God had a creative order. I, I, I'm getting ready to preach that in a few more weeks. So when I do, how many will give me some love? And please don't call, don't call the cops nor the political police. Just keep saying amen in the name of Jesus. So Jesus is a man's man. He said, I'm passionate to have the Passover with you. So what is the Passover and why is it so important? Well, the Passover is what? It's God's remembrance of the traditional celebration of the Jews when they came out of Egypt. Remember in the time of, of Moses, uh, the death messenger was going to go through the land. And God said, take the blood, apply it to the doorposts and the mantle of your home. And when the death messenger comes to the land, every home, every house, every household where I see the blood applied, the death messenger will pass over. There will be a pass over over you and death will not come to your house. So the Israelites were delivered out of Egypt. Uh, Pharaoh said, get out. God said, let, uh, Moses said, let my people go. And, and Pharaoh sent them all out. So they commemorated that every year in Passover. So the question is then, why is it so important? Well, I don't know if you've heard me teach us in this before, but just listen up for, for a few minutes. The Passover process is taught in the tradition of the Jewish supper called the Seder. How many are familiar with that? Seder means order. So in other words, there is some order that is taught in the Jewish Seder that reveals God's purpose and God's plan for the spiritual formation 
of all people. Here at Family First, we don't look at discipleship as a program. We looked at it as a pattern. And God wants all people to know him, to find freedom, to discover purpose in their life, and then make a difference. And those are revealed in the four cups. If you put up the screen that talks about the four cups in Passover, in the Seder celebration, there's four cups that they had in this meal. There's the cup of sanctification. That's the cup called Kedush. There's the cup called the legend or the story. That's called the Haggadah. There's the cup of blessing or restoration. That's called the Barakah. There's the cup of praise, which is the Hallel. And when they go through these four cups in the Passover celebration, what they're knowing is that God wants all people to know him to be sanctified. He wants all people to have a story to tell. He wants all people to discover the purpose of God for their life. And he wants all people to become involved in a process that makes a difference. How many want to be a part of the, the solution rather than part of the problem? That's what God's purpose is in Passover. And all this is in the book of Exodus. Go ahead and put this verse up. Look at this. Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 and 7 says this. Therefore, say to the people of Israel. I know that's a lot of writing, but if you look at it carefully. I am the Lord. And God says, number one, Moses, tell the people. I will, number one, bring you out. What's that a picture of? Getting brought out. Salvation. How many are glad you got brought out? How many are glad you're no longer living in the, in the land of slavery and bondage to sin? How many are glad that God brought you out of, out of, uh, of Egypt into the land of promise? And so God says, I'll bring you out. That's a cup of sanctification. And then God said... Tell the people that I will deliver you from slavery to them. It's one thing to get delivered out of Egypt. It's another thing to get Egypt cast out of you. Now, I'm preaching better you're shouting right now. But it's one thing to get saved out of the world. It's another thing to get sanctified till the world gets out of you. And sometimes that takes a little while. And so God says, I want all people to come to the knowledge of the saving gospel of Jesus. But I also want all people to get delivered from past hang-ups and, and habits and desires and, and things that are in their past that manipulate them and control them. And the best way that they can do that is in accountable reality relationships with other people in the body of Christ so that when you go to a connect group, where's, where's Shelton at? He's right here. He's my connect group leader. He's my uh, elder of connect groups. In fact, I said to the first service, I said, don't anybody turn around, but who can tell me what it says on the big sign on the back wall of the church? See there? That's what I thought. Now take a real quick peek and look back there and then answer my question. What's it say on the real big sign on the back wall of the church? FFA connect groups. Why? Why do we put people in connect groups? Why does Shelton organize, what, close to 20 now, 18 or so, almost 20 connect groups. Are we trying to, to be your social directors? Are we trying to, to hook you up with people so that you can go to each other's houses and party? Are we just trying to, no, no, no. What we're trying to do is get you in a relationship with another person so that when you're in a relationship with that other person and in conversation, they say something like, well, you know, when I first got saved, I didn't understand this. And a light bulb comes on in your head and you say, well, I thought I was the only one that didn't understand that so if God helped you understand that then why don't you explain it to me and in an account of personal relationship then we can grow because we're better together and somebody else might think they were the only one that after they got saved struggled with this or that but then as guys are outside butch riding their bicycles on a Saturday morning and some of the guy says you know before I got saved I struggled with this and even after now I'm a Christian I'm right with God but but butch I, I still I still have a challenge with this sometimes and in an accountable relationship butch says well you know what there's a lot of people that do that in fact i did that too but here's how god delivered me here's how god helped me get out of that process in an accountable relationship with other people we find freedom Amen. that's why i want you to get in a connect group i'm not your social director i'm not trying to facilitate your social life but I'm trying to get you cooked up with other people so that you can realize other people have the same problems you have 
So in conversations with other people, and you can discover how they got healing, and you can be healed of the same problems they have. But you understand that? That's this second cup. I'll deliver you from slavery. And then God says, I'll redeem you. You know what that means? To restore you back to your original design. You were created for a purpose. You were created on purpose for a purpose. The divine design of God's plan and purpose for your life is a signpost of what he's created you to do. But the problem was the world messed us up. Sin destroyed our divine design and we got confused. And now we don't know we know who we are, much less what we were created to do. So God has to redeem us. He has to restore us. He has to take, <laughs> I know it's a shameless illustration, but I got to do it anyway. God has to take the 1970 Mustang Mach 1 that Jared found on the side of the road in Lakeland, Florida that wouldn't run, and we tried to get it home, and the gas line broke, and it almost caught on fire, and the paint was all dull, and it was all uh, just not very attractive, but over a process of six weeks, it was painted, it was polished, it was tuned, it was re re renewed until it got best in show last weekend at a car show because God took something that was all messed up. It was created in 1970. It would have been to die for. But a lot of stuff happened from 1970 to 19, uh, to 2000 and I don't know, about 8, 10 years ago, whatever that is, to 2015. A lot of stuff happened. But then it was renewed. It was refreshed. It was restored back to its original design. And I don't know about some of you, but when God God created me to be a purpose of sacred worth and importance, to be an honor to the glory of God. This world has tried to tear me up, chew me up, spit me out, destroy God's design for my life. But when I came to the cross and when I came to a relationship with Jesus and when I got in the word of God, I found I can be renewed. I can be made fresh. I can be made whole. I can be just like God wanted me to be in the first place so I can fulfill the divine design that God intended from day number one in my life. And that's what he said to Israel. And then he said, number four, I'll take you to be my people. And what did God say? I'm going to paraphrase this. God said, I'm going to put you on display. And the whole world is going to see you. And they're going to see that I did a work in you when I brought you out from under the Egyptians and I brought you into the land of the promise. Now, that's God's promise to the Israelites, but that's spiritually God's promise to all people in the body of Christ. God wants to put us on display. God wants us. Remember that Sunday a few weeks ago I talked about that we are the aroma of Christ. We're the fragrance of Christ in this world. When they saw... The, the uh, disciples in Acts chapter 4, they, they took note of them that they had been with Jesus. How did they know they had been with Jesus? Because they smelled like Jesus. They responded like Jesus would respond. They answered. They said the words that Jesus would have said. And God says, I want to put you on display so that you will make a difference. So if you go back to that screen, we want every person to know God to find freedom, to discover purpose, and make a difference. And if you've never been through growth track here at Family First, I strongly encourage you to hook up with Pastor Cesar. He teaches this. It's normally on the fourth Wednesday night of every month. And that's how you find out what the church is all about. That's how you find out what God has called you to do. What are your passions and your desires? That's how you track with us in leadership. And that's how you get plugged in to be what we call the dream team. Because it takes, dream, it takes teamwork to make the dream work. Do you realize, a lot of you do, maybe not everyone, tonight, 6 o'clock tonight. In fact, we could use some help when the service is over. We're going to stack the chairs and Amanda's going to kind of lead that process and get everything kind of ready for our banquet dinner tonight. We're going to honor dozens of people here in our church fellowship that are what we call dream teamers. Amen. They'll be the people that are here all day on Friday getting ready to serve hundreds of children on Friday night to our egg, Easter egg glow event. They're the people that'll be out in the parking lots. They're the people that got here at 7 o'clock this morning to prepare the service and to practice the songs and get ready for the presentation. 
And if you've never tracked in that process of giving yourself to God to serve, I don't know if Pastor Omar, if you're the one praying in the Holy Ghost, somebody's praying in the Holy Ghost right now. That's all I can say because I'm going to go there. I get so sick and tired, it drives me crazy. And I know that some of you think that's a short trip. It, 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 drives, it drives me crazy. All this stuff I see on social media right now. Well, I don't have to be a I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. I can serve God at home. You can't even respond to a stupid statement like that. When it's, people say that kind of stuff, I thought, I can't even answer that. I, I, I could show them the scripture, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, and all the more as you see the day approaching. In other words, the worse our world gets, the more we need to be in church, the more we need to stop laying out of church because we need each other. But if you read that in Hebrews chapter 10, the context of it says you don't have to come to church to get something. That's, that's not what Hebrews 10 is all about. Hebrews 10 is all about why don't you come to church because there might be something in you that somebody else needs. And if you stay home because you think you don't have to go to church to be a Christian, you're robbing yourself, but you're not particularly robbing yourself of something you could have received. What you're robbing yourself of is an opportunity to help someone else because God put you in the body of Christ and gave you giftings and a Things, and there's other people that need what you got and you're so selfish you're sitting at home on on facebook on sunday morning rather than coming to the body of christ because you think you need it all and you just got everything well i'm so glad you got it all figured out but the rest of the people in the body of christ need you to help them and you're too busy sitting at home on your blessed assurance come on, come on somebody <laughs> i don't know what happened here but it's it's good I'm preaching pretty good. Can you say amen? amen? That's the truth. It's just exactly the way my wife told me to tell you. And I'm, I'm saying it. It's saying it word for word today. I'm raining it in. I'm, I'm, I'm truly am. I'm raining it in. Jesus said, I passionately desire to celebrate the last supper with you before I suffer. And then he said this, number two. There's only three. We're moving on. Verse 19, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Not only did he passionately desire to have the Last Supper with his disciples, but he passionately desired to give his body, which is broken for us. He passionately desired to go to the cross, to give his body as the bread of life. Jesus said something incredible in John chapter 6. He said what? I am the bread of life. And he said, whoever comes to me shall never hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. He made that statement in the context of just having fed 5,000 people with the five loaves and the two fish. And what he was saying is, Unless the bread is served and, 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 and distributed and given away, no one can benefit. But this is my body, which is broken and served and distributed to whosoever will. And anyone that eats this bread and drinks the cup shall never hunger and never thirst. And Jesus was passionate to give his body as the bread of life. So that all could receive Jesus. Now I don't know what your version of Jesus is. I've already told you mine is he's a man's man. He's a passionate guy. But on another aspect. He's not some mythical character that, that doesn't have a real struggle in life. Because the Bible says, after he said this verse, this, this very chapter with his disciples in the upper room, it says he went out that night and he went to the Garden of Gethsemane. And he knelt down for the rest of the night, six hours or more till daybreak, and he prayed, Father, let this cup pass from me. 
I don't want to do this. I know I'm called to do it. Father, not my will, but thine be done. But there's nothing inside me that wants to be humiliated. There's nothing inside me that wants to be crucified, that wants to be tortured and hung naked for six hours on a public street for every person to walk by and ridicule and condemn me. You see, there was a human side of Jesus. And if your Jesus is so spiritual that he's not human, you got the wrong Jesus. Because my Jesus is 100% God and 100% man at the same time. I can understand that. I know that biologically that's difficult to process, but biblically it's accurate. 100% man, 100% God at the same time. The 100% God part of him never struggled. He always said yes to the will of the Father. But the 100% man part of him was human just like you or I are human. And he did not look forward to the suffering and to the punishment and the endurement that he would process. In fact, he was so torn. He was so, mm, what's the word? He, he was so stressed about that that it says from the pen of Dr. Luke, the physician, that being in such agony, he prayed until great drops of blood came through his skin. And I made this statement in the first service because I've studied it before. And Robert, one of our young men, had just been studying this on his own. And he brought me his phone and he showed me where he had recorded out of a medical journal the legal a medical name of this condition that's called hemotidrosis. Or I don't know the pronunciation. Hemotidrosis. When actually the body is under such stress, such trauma, that the capillaries under the skin, because of the chemicals that stress release, in your bloodstream it caused the capillaries under your skin to actually rupture and so blood literally oozes through your pores Jesus did that because he was under such stress that night to say no to his own flesh and say yes to the will of God but he did so because and get this how many know that your your spirit man will vote for righteousness every time right, right? And how many know your flesh man will vote for sin every time? I know some of you are more spiritual than me, but my, my flesh man votes for sin every single time. My spirit man always votes for righteousness. So who makes the cast, who casts the deciding ballot? The mind does. The mind that's controlled by the spirit is life and peace. My spirit says yes to the will of God. My flesh always says yes to my passions and my desires. But my mind that is controlled by the Holy Spirit is where the decision is made. And if I make the decision in my mind, my mind speaks to my flesh and my soul. Get yourself in order and come under the direction of the spirit man. Because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And I'm off my subject, but I'm going to go ahead and teach it because some of you haven't heard it I don't overcome the power of sin through willpower I know some of you think maybe you can so serving Jesus is not like a diet it's not like if you got the willpower you know then all power to you no you you try to serve God by willpower you're setting yourself up for failure we don't serve God by willpower we serve God by spirit power but if I say yes to the will then God supplies the power it's, it's like the light bulbs that are on in this building. I don't supply the power. With Lacucci, River Electric Company supplies the power if I pay the bill. The power's on. But when I walked in the building this morning, I had to make a conscious decision to flip the switch. The flipping of the switch didn't provide the power. The power was already there. The flipping of the switch merely completed the connection. Just, it just merely completed the release. The power was already there. The power of God is inside of me. It's inside of you. It's available. Don't ever tell me the devil made you do it. The devil can't make you do anything. What happens is you do it yourself when you refuse to flip the switch and say yes to the power of God that's available to you. And if you'll say yes to that power, God will release it inside side of you and you overcome because greater is he that's in you than he that's in this world and Jesus said I want to go and my body be and then he said lastly number three go ahead and put it up I'll just stay down here he passionately desired to what pour out his blood to establish the new covenant verse number 20 
uh, 20 says, and likewise the cup. After they had eaten, he took the cup and he said, this cup is poured out for you. It's the new covenant in my blood. And Jesus passionately desired to do that. Now, I want to transition because I've talked about the passion of Jesus. How many believe Jesus was passionate about what he did? How many believe he fulfilled his passion? He completed what the Father assigned for him to do. I already know about Jesus' passion. I want to know about your passion. I want to know what drives us. What, what pushes us forward? Do, do we just float along through life? Do we just like Doris Day, que sera, sera, what will be, will be? Do we just float along through life? Are, are we all a bunch of fatalists? Come on, don't anybody get mad at me. Are we of that crowd that says, well, you know, if it's God's will, it'll automatically happen. Baloney. Just because it's God's will doesn't make anything automatically happen. It's a human decision in alignment with the will of God that releases the fulfillment of God's purposes. What is our passion? What is our driving desire? And I, my prayer is that we can look at the passion of Jesus because he knew who he was. He knew who he was in relationship with and knew the assignment that the father had on his life. And he knew the gifts and the abilities that the Father had given him. When you get a revelation of all that, you know who you are. You know who you're not. You know who you're called to be. You know what God has gifted you to be. And you walk in your lane. You stay in your, in your own lane. You operate in your own anointings, in your own, in your own giftings and abilities. And you walk in through the passion that God has for your life. I said this in the first service. Pastor Meredith, why don't you come on up? I guess I'm just going to go ahead and say it here. Because if I don't say it in this service, somebody who was in the other service will probably tell you about it anyway. <laughs> I came to church this morning a little bit distracted. Okay? Is that all right? I hope your opinion of me didn't just tank. I'm not a plastic preacher living a plastic life. I have a real wife, just like the rest of you. I had a week. Did you ever wake up one day and have a bad week? I had a week. I had a few days. I came in this morning a little bit distracted. And I'm standing down here. It's 8.30 in the morning. I mean, how are you supposed to be holy and righteous at 8 o'clock in the morning anyway? Come on, somebody. Give me a break. You know. So we start singing and worshiping the Lord. And. That first song, you know, it's an upbeat, happy kind of. God, has got that little thing going up there. And he's, he, he's, he's got that long hair just kind of flowing along. And, and, and Pastor Meredith and Michelle over here, the drums, he's, he's got that beat flowing. And I'm sitting here and I'm saying, not feeling it. Don't know this song. Not interested in learning this song. I'm just going to wait this one out. I just read your mind. Somebody say Amen. But then we just kind of process a little while. And Meredith started playing that song that she's playing right now. And my mind instantly went back. And I'm not trying to be like dramatic here. I'm just, I'm just telling you the truth. 2006, this song was written 17 years ago. One of the first songs that Pastor Meredith, she's just a little girl. 17 years ago. I mean, what were you? I know you never tell a lady's age. She, she, she was just a young lady 17 years ago. Very young lady. She was a girl 17 years ago. She wasn't even a lady yet. She was a lady girl. Anyway, I, I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting myself messed up here. But anyway, one of the first songs she ever taught this church to sing, I See the King of Glory. I hear the people singing. I see a revival on the horizon. If God will teach us to have our hearts broken with the things that break his heart. And the Holy Spirit began to awaken me this morning. To the fact that I've got an assignment on my life. 
my seed is mighty on the earth the destiny of God that's operating inside of me is greater than all the distractions and all the disappointments and all the derailments that Satan might try to throw at me I came in here at 8 30 not ready to preach but by the time I got finished I had preached myself right out of my discouragement, right into my passion, because I discovered there's an anointing, there's a blessing, there's an assignment. And if you operate in the lane that God has offered you to operate in, all the power of darkness. And I know you're not preachers, not all of you, some of you, but whatever your gifting, wherever you serve, whatever God's asked you, if God's called you to be a Christian businessman that makes lots and lots of money, then do it for the glory of God and support the work of the ministry and know that you're doing what God has called you to do and you're operating in your assignment. If you're a grandma and you're raising grandchildren and you're teaching them the nurture, the admonition of God, then be a godly granny and raise your grandchildren to love God with all their heart, their soul, their mind, and their strength. And know that the assignment on your life is just as great as the people that stand on the crowds and speak to hundreds of thousands because you're doing what God has called you to do. Whatever God's called you to do, do it with great conviction and operate in the level of blessing that's on your life i'll tell you another story is that okay when you have kids you can embarrass them it's just the way it goes you see that big fat white guitar up there that's spelled p-h-a-t that car <laughs> that guitar's fat that's spelled p-h-a-t that's a gretch white falcon because it makes a big fat sound and uh, Chris and I bought that for Jared in 2007 when he turned 21 years old and at that particular time the lead guitarist for Hillsong and his name was Michael Guy Chislett recorded the song that she's playing right now with that guitar not that one but one exactly like that. Same color, same make, same model, same sound. And that song went across the nations. Millions of people have been blessed by Hosanna. Hosanna. Now, I'm telling that story as a mere illustration. And if you think I'm bragging about my family or me, I am, but that's not the point. <laughs> The point is, if you discover what God has called you to do and you operate in your lane, there'll be blessing and consistency and longevity. Come on, help me, Pastor Omar. What's our word? What's our word? You and I's word, sustainable. We talk about this all the time. We want family first to have a sustainable move of God. Not one that lasts 15 minutes, but one that lasts 15 years. Amen. Not a revival that lasts for four days, but one that lasts for four decades. Amen. Not a message that just gets a, a, a big audience and gets a bunch of likes on Instagram, but a message that has lasting legacy in people's lives because a foundation is going to stand the test of time. And if you discover your passion, like Jesus discovered his passion, God will put you in that place where you'll have sustainable, long-lasting influence in the lives of other people. And it'll drive the devil crazy, let me tell you. He'll come after you with both guns blazing. But you can just sit back, take a couple of deep breaths and say, go ahead, devil, <laughs> take your best shot. Because God is still doing what he's doing through my faithful obedience to Jesus. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the heart. Stand up, would you please?
sing that verse that talks about, I see a generation. I see God working in the world today. He's rising up a remnant church that's going to make a difference in the days that are to come. Thank you, Jesus. I know we could worship, we could sing. The presence of Jesus is here. We could just do this all afternoon. Let me ask you a question today. Have you said yes to the call of God on your life? I got a couple of appeals today. Here's number one. Have you said yes to his call for salvation? Do you know that you know that Jesus is the Lord of your life? And if you were stand before God today and he would say, why should I let you in my heaven? You wouldn't say, well, because I'm a good person or because I do a lot of good things or this or that. Your answer would be because I have received the blood of Jesus that has cleansed me from my sin. And by faith, Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. I've been born again by the grace of God. That's the only reason why God should let me into heaven. If you've never prayed that prayer, you can pray it today. It's as simple as this. Dear God, forgive me of all my sin. Come into my life. I've made a mess of my life, but I need a Savior. And you're the only one that has the ability to forgive me of my sin because you're the only one that has paid the price for not only your sins, but also mine. So I ask you to come into my life. Be my Savior, my Lord, my very best friend. Give me strength to live for you all the days of my life. And if you pray that prayer today, just as quick as the snap of a finger, God comes into your life. Old things pass away. All things become new. How many pray that this morning? You've prayed it in the past or you're praying it today. Let me see your hand. I hope there's not one person in the room this morning that has not prayed that prayer. Either today right now or last week last month last year 50 60 70 years ago because the lord jesus is the only way to heaven a personal relationship with jesus christ he said i am the way the truth the life no one comes unto the father but by me my second appeal today is have you found your passion Your passion, I'll just give you this three minutes. Your passion is revealed by discovering the divine design that God created you with. If you're divinely designed to like certain things and not like other things, those are signposts to things that God has given you anointing to connect with and things that God has given you the ability to correct or to avoid. What makes you cry? Tears talk. What makes you happy? What makes you sad? If you watch the news and, and you're moved beyond description of the atrocities of abortion that are happening in our culture today, huh, that's a divine design clue that God has called you and commissioned you to reach out to young mothers that need mentors and need people to love them during their time of challenge whatever it is that moves you 
Those are signposts of the problem that God's called you to fix. The area that he's given you the opportunity to serve. And you'll never find joy. You'll never find the highest level of fulfillment in your life until you say yes to God's divine design to not only save salvation, but a full life of service in accordance with the divine direction of God for your life. And I want that for you. Because I'm not here. I got to close. I know, was 1227. I didn't know you knew there was a clock up there. I should have never told you. I have no idea what time it is. You know what it means when a pastor looks at his clock, don't you, his watch? And what's it mean? Absolutely nothing. But I really want God's best for you. I don't want you to sit at Family First Sunday after Sunday and just go through a, a passionless life. I'm not here to build a big church. I'm here to build big people. And I want you full of the favor and the blessing of God for your life. So, Father, we bless the people today on Palm Sunday. I pray that as they go from this place today, they go with the conviction and the courage that your anointing inside of them is greater than all of the attacks that come against them. In fact, the anointing attracts the attacks, but it also, those attacks, verify that the reality of that anointing. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. So God bless you today as you go. If we could have some help today, uh, come see Amanda. We're going to take up the chairs and get ready for the activities later today. God bless you. Have an awesome, awesome day in Jesus. God.